Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Hey, I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy around here. If you are fairly new to the church, you probably are like, who is that guy up there? I've been gone for the last several weeks. I was out. I'm so grateful for Pastor Marcus and Natalie. They allow me to go out and travel and speak uh, about the books that I write. And um, so I was in Alabama for two weekends in a row, speaking to a bunch of pastors, pastor's conference. Then I did a conf- another conference. So, um, But I'm back. I'll be here for the next few weeks. And we're going to continue our series today called The Right Answer questions, the right questions. Uh, but, but first, I wanted to do a little bit of shameless self promotion, okay? So, y'all ready for this? One, you may remember about two years ago, we did a series here called The Circle Perspective. And uh, that, I, that series I turned into a book, and I wanted to call it Circle Perspective, but the publisher decided they wanted to call it Connecting the Dots. And since they pay the bills, the book is called Connecting the Dots. Um, <laughs> So uh, Connecting the Dots is the book. It's going to be coming out March the 12th. It's about the circular nature of God's work in our life. How uh, you'll, you'll oftentimes in life find yourself going, wait, we're doing this again, God? I th- what? what? Uh, here again? That again? And, and how Psalm 23, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me in paths of righteousness. And that Hebrew word paths means paths made of circles. So the book's about the circular nature of God's work in our life. Uh, it's available for pre-order. Um, you can scan this QR code if you want to pre-order it like six months in advance, you know. That's really in advance, but you'll be hearing more about it as it comes up. Second thing I want to uh, tell you guys, remind you of, if you didn't know, my dad and I do, my dad was doing that marriage, we do the marriage class between services. If you didn't know about that, every, between services, my dad does a marriage class with my mom. And he and I do a podcast together where we just talk about whatever we think is interesting. Um, I think it's pretty interesting. So uh, that's every Thursday, there's new episodes, and it's, it's amazing to see who listens to that thing. We have listeners in like 120 countries. It's really crazy, yeah. It's really wild. So anyways, all right, enough shameless self-promotion. Let's talk about you now. So we're going to talk today about, you know, we've been talking about these questions that we need to ask. And the question we're going to ask today is this, what story do I want my life to tell? Because at the end of our lives, a bunch of people are going to gather in a room, they're all going to put on black, and they're going to talk about you. You know? Is this mic already jacking up here? Every mic. Every mic. I broke the other one already, right? But this is the second one. All right. And uh, I was going to tell you, uh, so when I was an associate pastor, a lady came to our church and she said, um, hey, I want you to do a funeral for a family member of mine. She didn't come to church here. I was like, oh, that's exciting. Let me try and do a funeral. It was the first funeral I had ever done. Didn't know what I was doing. Somebody gave me a little funeral book for how to conduct funerals. If you ever see a pastor, they've got a little black book. Um, What that is, is it's literally instructions for how to conduct a funeral. So, uh, you know. I'd never done a funeral before. Well, one of the things it said in there is leave time for the, dece- for the people to talk, uh, tell stories about the deceased. And I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. So let's do that. So I get to this funeral home and the place is packed. I mean, wall to wall people, just full of people. And uh, I read a eulogy, to- talked a little bit about the lady. And then I said, now I'd like to leave time if anyone would like to talk about the deceased. And a bunch of people lined up along the wall. And the first guy got up and he got up, you know, and you know the awkward moment where it's kind of like he adjusts the mic and, like it feeds back and then it's like, he's like, she was so mean. She used to hit me with sandals. But you know, I, I think she was trying to say she loved me. And he kind of lowered his head and walked away and I was like, oh snap. Good thing we got that one out of the way, right? So the next lady comes up and she gets up there and, you know, she's got a little tear rolling down her eye and she's like, she was always so angry. She would hit me and say, I know you did something wrong, so I'm going to hit you now. (laughs) But, you know, I think deep down she was trying to say she loved us. She gets off the stage. I'm thinking, this is going south very quickly. Do I need to cut off the testimonials or like let things go, right? So more people came up. It ended up on a slightly high note, but it got me thinking about like, you know, sometimes you go to these funerals and people kind of have to lie about the person or convince themselves that the person was somebody they weren't. I went to a funeral the other day of a friend of mine. I knew her from the time we were 18. When she was in her mid-20s, she renounced God, claimed she was an atheist, started just ranting about the church and the hypocrites in the church, and she drank herself to death and got addicted to all sorts of drugs and alcohol. She was a tragic death. She died at 39. And our, this funeral, I was like, 
I thought I was going to be the only one at the funeral. I was like, I'll do my duty. I'll show up at the funeral. Well, I got to the funeral. There's a lot of people there. And I was like, what? Wow, wow, there's a lot of people here. Like, And there's a lot of church people, people she hated, showed up at her funeral. I was like, this is so weird. And then there's this famous, super famous pastor from San Antonio. If I said his name, you know who I'm talking about. He showed up. And I, when I saw him walk out to do the funeral, I'm like, what is that guy doing this funeral for? And I realized that this girl's mom was super close to this pastor. So he was doing the funeral. And I thought, how's he going to do this funeral? Because everybody knows she's been living like hell. Like... <laughs> I'm like, this is going to be interesting because this guy's a pro, right? This guy's a pro. So I'm like, what is he going to say? So I'm taking out my notepad. I'm like, what is he going to say? <laughs> he gets up and he's like, we've come today to acknowledge that so-and-so has gone to eternity. And we all are grieving and we're sad. And then he went on to talk about how God comforts those who are grieving. I'm like, that was smooth. He never had to say anything about where in eternity she end up. I was like, I'm going to take notes on that, right? So here's the thing I know about everybody in this room, though, okay? You don't want people to have to lie at your funeral. And we've all been to funerals where you can tell people are, like, working it out in their head. Like, I, I know deep down I think he loved me, but, uh, you know, he was just never around. And, and we've been to funerals where it's like, this is really awkward. And then you don't speak no ill of the dead. Isn't that what they say? So we have to kind of come up with stuff to convince ourselves this is a good person. But honestly, like our life tells a story. And everybody knows what story your life is telling. So we want to talk today about how to make sure that your life tells a story that is something you'd be proud of. And more importantly, something that God would be proud of. So there's a verse in Hebrews it's an interesting verse, and I think that it talks about one of the keys to making sure that your life tells a good story. And it talks about, well, well let's just read the verse. Hebrews eleven four says this, by faith, Abel, if you remember the two brothers, Cain and Abel, we've heard of them, right? Even if you haven't been in church, you've probably heard of Cain and Abel. Cain killed his brother Abel. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain through which he was commended as righteous. Righteous just means in good standing with God. God was like, I like that. That is pleasing to me. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. I think what this is saying is, if you want your life to speak past the grave, the key is in the sacrifices you make when you're on earth. But you got to make the right sacrifice because we see from the story of Cain and Abel here, Abel, here's what happened. It says, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel, his brother, also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. Now, there's no indication here. There's all sorts of scholars that have all these, you know, this is why it was. It was because Cain's heart wasn't in the right place. There's no indication for why God didn't like Cain's offering. We can only guess at it. It's not in the text, though. We don't know why God accepted Cain's and why he accepted Abel's. Some say he accepted Abel's because Abel's was a picture of the blood sacrifice that would be required in a picturing of Jesus. But there's no indication. Like, God didn't say, this is the kind of sacrifice you, just need, to, you need to bring me. It's just, he just said, Cain, I don't like your sacrifice. So Cain gets angry. Well, God doesn't seem to have a lot of sympathy because the Lord says to Cain, Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you don't do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Now, here's the really interesting thing in this verse. It has layers and layers of depth to it. This word sin is the Hebrew word chata, which is an archery term. It means to miss the mark or target. So you take aim, miss the target. God is telling Cain, you aimed at the wrong thing, buddy. You missed it. And just because you sacrificed, it doesn't mean I necessarily like it. And, and, and this is a really powerful thing, okay? So there's sin that we know the, the effects of sin, right? The Bible says stay away from sin. Sin makes you feel guilty. It makes you feel dirty. But here's the really crazy thing. It's possible to love God, love your family, live an upright life, like not sin, have the best of intentions, and still make the wrong sacrifice. And you'll feel the same results as sin. Regret, disappointment at yourself. 
You're kicking yourself for doing you know, the mistakes that you made. Another way to say it is this. You can do nothing wrong and still not get it right. Because it's about more than just keeping from sin. It's about making sure that you make the right sacrifices in life. And, and, and understand this. We naturally sacrifice for what we value in life. If you think about that, you just naturally do. Some of you got a newborn baby. You know that takes sacrifice. You're sacrificing your sleeve. You women are sacrificing your bodies to that little eating machine. It's like you sacrifice, but it's because you love them. And, and here's the thing. If you want to know what somebody values, look at what they do with their time, their money, and their energy. Not what they say or do or think or feel. Just look what they do with their actions. That's how you know what somebody truly values. And what we're willing to sacrifice for shows what we really value. But it's really quite possible to make the wrong sacrifice. And here's where I see people making the wrong sacrifice. Now, if you've been around me for more than 37 seconds, you've seen this before, okay? Some of you, this is completely new. This is like all I talk about when I go out and speak. I've written an entire book about what this triangle means in your life, in the psychology of how you live your life, and your hopes and dreams, your greatest fears and your anger. So I'm gonna blow through this right now, but if you want more information about it, like there's a whole book about it in the back, you can get it. But listen, what, what most of us end up making the wrong sacrifices for are these three things, because deep within us, we all have three foundational needs. We all need security, we need to know we're safe physically, emotionally, financially. We all need a sense of connection with others, a relationship with others, uh, feeling valued, feeling seen, feeling heard, feeling understood. And we all need a sense of empowerment or control. Like we have some say over our decisions. If you think about it in the Garden of Eden, God gave us all these things. He plopped us in a perfect garden. There's nothing to threaten our security. He hung out with us, it says, in the cool of the day. And then it says, he, he's like, you got the run of the whole place. Just don't do one thing. But what was the first, what happened when, we, when they did that one thing they weren't supposed to do? Immediately fear came in. It said they realized they were vulnerable. They were naked and afraid. They realized they didn't have the security, the connection and empowerment because we were made to get all those things from God. He made us to need those things. There's nothing wrong with you for needing these things. He made you to need them. But what happens is when we, get, when we were separated from God through sin, we felt immediately a disconnection from God and we felt a need to watch out for our own security connection or a sense of control. And what ends up playing out is we spend most of our time focused on getting those things. So we're focused on getting security. We're saying, man, you know what? I'm going to work hours and hours on end and work overtime and make all those extra hours so that my kids can have all that stuff I never got growing up. I didn't get to go to, you know, my kid, you know, I want to send my kid to cheerleading camp. I want to make sure that they've got all the shoes I, that they want. I want to make sure they've got the cool shoes. They're not the, the, the outside poor kids, right? So you work, work hours and hours and hours trying to build security for your family. And some people in the connection corner, what you do is you're just always saying yes. You're hoping to never be rejected. You're like, man, if I can just make sure that I'm always doing what people ask of me, if I'm people pleasing, always going overboard, bend, bending over backwards to help people, I'll never be rejected by them. But the deep down resentment that's building and you're saying, man, I'm always taken advantage of. I always give love to people, but they never give it back. I'm always taken advantage of. So it's leading to anger. There's that word again. Maybe you're in my corner over here where your biggest fear is control. So you're always thinking, is this going to control me? Is he trying to control me? Is that going to control me? And you make all your decisions based on what's going to control you. And so what happens is you end up sacrificing good things for the sake of getting the thing that you're afraid of not having. And usually we have one sensitive area and you end up making the wrong sacrifice. So here's where Jesus comes along and says this. He says, look, I need you to do something. Don't worry saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? Or what will we wear? Security, connection, control. Don't worry about those things. He says, for pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. Like he made you to need those things, the security, the connection, control. He made you to need those things in him. And he says, so if you want those things, don't seek those things. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. He's basically saying, if you want security and connection and control, don't aim at those things. Aim at me and I'll make sure all those things materialize. I don't know how it works, but he says, if you'll aim at the highest good, he will make sure and provide all those other areas that you need. 
but you have to make the right sacrifice in the process. And where I see a lot of people make the mistake of the wrong sacrifice is they're looking for the security, they're looking for the connection, they're looking for the control, and other, in their family, people are paying the price. I had a guy come up to me at a wedding one time. He'd had a few too, few too many beers. I had just done the wedding, and he came up to me and said, hey, man, I loved what you had to say about love. But, man, it's really hard to love when your kid tries to commit suicide. And I was like, whoa, what? I said, did your kid try and commit suicide? He's like, yeah. He's like, you know, I work so many extra hours. I'm at work 12 hours a day trying to give that daughter of mine everything that she could get, cheerleading camp, all the cool clothes. And then one day I get a call. I get a call from the uh, counselor's office and they say, your daughter just tried to take her life in the bathroom at school. And it made me so angry. She has no respect for how hard I work, for all the things I do. She doesn't like the sacrifice I'm making. And I was trying to be kind with him, but I was like, did you see this coming? And he never, he claims he never saw it coming because he was so busy trying to build security for his family or maybe his connection, whatever it was, whatever he was trying to do, he completely missed the fact that his relationship was falling apart and he made the wrong sacrifice. And the price was his anger over something his daughter was doing, which was really a cry for help. And we end up making wrong sacrifices all the time. And here's the really tricky thing about this aim thing. It's a moving target. It changes in every season of life. When you have a newborn, when you have a kid in, in elementary school, middle school, high school, it requires different sacrifices. Different seasons of marriage require different sacrifices. There will be times that you have to say, I'm going to have to pull back on working extra hours and we're going to have to tighten our belt a little bit on money because my marriage is falling apart and I can't afford to be gone all of the time. And you got to make the right sacrifice there. Because listen, you don't get credit just for making a sacrifice. The sacrifice has to be in line with what God values if it, we want it to go well for you, as the verse says to Cain. So, how do you know if you're making the right sacrifices? Well, I've found that there's a marker point. It's like, a, it's like this siren. It's like a blaring siren. And whenever I see this siren, I know something is off in the sacrifice. I'm, somewhere along the way, I'm making a wrong sacrifice. Because something always has to be sacrificed to make sure our values are in line with what God wants. Remember this. You only have so much time, so much money, and so much energy. And if everything has the same value, nothing has value. Some things have to be more important than others. You have to prioritize what is most important. I learned this the hard way. Right after our daughter was born, uh, about six months afterwards, my wife and I were taking a walk. We were strolling Elise along. And I said, how you doing? She's like, I feel alone. I was like, alone? It's like, woman, <laughs> do you not see how hard I'm working trying to provide for you? Because men, we freak out when a baby's coming along, don't we? How am I going to provide for this? And I had launched this coaching business that was literally killing it. We were making loads of money. I was like, we've got the money we need to take care of this baby, right? But my wife, meanwhile, is saying, I feel alone. And I'm like, how dare you feel alone? Don't you know I'm sacrificing? I'm working my tail off. I got angry. So what I did is I sat down and I figured out, all right, I need to figure out what my priorities are. Because I... I'm, I just got to make sure that everything that has its value is getting its proper time, money, and energy, right? And I came and I wrote it down. And I said, here's what I value. And this is the order I value it in. I want God to be first. And I believe this is the proper order. God, if he's not first in your life, Jesus said that. If you don't put God before your family, you're not worthy of the kingdom of God, it says. So I believe it's God. And then I believe it's my wife. Then I believe it's my daughter. Then I believe it's my health. Because if I don't have my health together, I can't get any of this stuff done then work, and then finances. And how do I know when a value is out of line? It's whenever anger or frustration shows up in me or in those around me. When Emily says, you're spending too much time at work, which is very tricky because I work from home. I know that this lesser value is up here in this spot, and that's why anger is showing up. Anger is this beautiful siren, say it's like a, an engine light saying, something's off under the hood, you need to check what's going on. And if you don't like the word anger, use the word frustration, whatever it is. It's a threat to your sense of security, connection, or control, right? So I started doing this exercise 
with people. Uh, I do it in corporate settings. Uh, I've got a, a whole workbook about it, and I help businesses figure out their priorities. And, and I started doing this with individuals, and I found uh, it was very helpful for people. So, like, um, I had this uh, one, one lady, and she was saying, yeah, so we were, we were working through it. And she's like, man, one of my, one of my values, high values, it's like, it's like God, my family. And then she had cleanliness down here, which I was like, that's a great value. Cleanliness. Yeah, it's next to godliness. And she goes, but I realized why you were talking relationships with other people are really important for me, but I feel like I'm missing out in those areas and I've been angry and frustrated that I'm not having any time with friends and relationships. And she said, and I realized why, because I'm so obsessed with cleanliness and she has like five kids under the age of four. And she's like, whenever I have a Friday night free, all I want to do is clean the house. And I ain't for sure ain't going to have anybody over to our messy house. So she's like, I'm missing out on all these relationships outside the house because I'm obsessed with cleanliness. A lesser value was coming up and taking priority over spending time with my friends. And she said, I'm going to have to just live with a dirty house, I guess, for a while if I want the relationships. And here's where it gets really tricky. Sometimes the sacrifice you'll have to make can be scary. I had a lady that came to me and she said, you know, I realized something while you were talking. She was doing the workbook. And I'm going to give you access to the workbook in a minute here. But... Um, she said, for me, for, for years, for 13 years, it's been me and my son. She was a single mom. It's been God, my son, work. But recently I got married. And she said, and my husband's constantly been angry at me because she says, I'm getting less value than, her son, than, my, than your son is. She said, but here's my problem. He may leave me like the other guy did. And if he does, and I've put my son one rung below him, and he gets mad at me for that, then I'm gonna lose everything I love. I'll have lost my second husband and I'll have lost my son. She's like, but I know my husband needs to be first. I believe that's God's order. And I said, wow, that's scary. And she's like, it's very scary. And that's where faith comes in. You have to trust that God's order and the way he wants, what he values is going to work in your life even when it doesn't seem like it will work. You have to trust that. So the sign, the signal, just like we see with the story of Cain, that something is out of value, a value is out of order in our lives is anger and frustration in ourselves or those around us. And, and let me talk to guys right now. I've seen a lot of guys make the wrong sacrifice in this. They're dying inside because God has asked them to step out and take a risk and do something. But what they've done is they've instead said, no, I, I can't do that. And so in the name of security, they've sacrificed the dream God placed in them for the stable paycheck. And listen, there's nothing wrong with, paying, with providing for family. In fact, the Bible says a man who doesn't care for his family is worse than an infidel. But if God's calling you to do something and he's pushing you to do it and you keep pushing that aside and sacrificing that dream that he put in your heart for the sake of security, it's just gonna build anger and resentment within you. And it's gonna eat away at you. Henry David Thoreau said, most men lead lives of quiet desperation and they go to the grave with the song still in them. How many men have sacrificed the greatness God has put in them out of their own fear, out of their own need for security? And let's, again, it's tricky because you got to care for your family, but know this. If you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and put him above all else, you can be confident that God will provide for your family and he does a way better job than you ever could. But you have to seek him and what he's asking you to do and then make the right sacrifices. So here... here Here's an interesting thing. You know, Jesus never asked us to do anything he didn't do himself. And this famous verse here, we all know it. It says, God so loved the world that he gave or he sacrificed his son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And I think this is fascinating because God gave his own son. God sacrificed his son for the sake of his bride, the church. The church is called the bride of Christ. He set the example. He said, our... My son's, yeah, that's, which is pretty powerful, speaking to how much he loves us. He was willing to give his own son for the sake of his bride, the church. That's you and me. But here's a really cool part. I've seen this over and over again, that when you make the right sacrifice at the right time, God will often resurrect the thing you sacrificed in a more glorious form. Just like he did with his son, Jesus. Yes, he sacrificed him, but then his son rose again, glorious, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And he'll do that oftentimes with your dreams. I was talking to a lady the other day. When her first child was born, she had four of them. She felt like the Lord said, I want you to give up on your ambitions. She was a very ambitious lady. And I want you to stay home and homeschool all of your kids. 
So she spent 20 something years homeschooling them all. And again, this was her unique call. It's not, maybe you know what God's not calling you to do that, but that was her unique call and she knew it. She set aside her ambitions and it's crazy because when her last kid graduated, she started pursuing this dream that she had. And she started doing a, you know, in the last 20 years, a lot has changed, but she started doing a podcast conference and that podcast conference took off overnight. Like one touch of God's favor can launch you into the future, y'all. It's like God said, oh, you're willing to sacrifice and do what I've asked to, va to value what I value? She let that dream die. And then God said, now is the time to resurrect the dream. And in one touch of his favor, he launched her into the future. She couldn't have gotten there in 25 years on her own. But because she made the right sacrifice, he brought her dream back to life in a more glorious form. And he's doing things she never could have done on her own. And I've seen that over and over and over in the lives of, every, of lots of believers. When you make the right sacrifice for the season you're in, when you value what God values and you sacrifice whatever it takes to make sure what God values is in the right place, God will often later down the road, resurrect your dream and you go, oh my goodness, I can't believe we're doing this. I thought that dream was dead. And he's like, nope, it was just on hold. The dream is still alive. But now because you made the right sacrifice, I'm gonna make some glorious stuff out of this. But you have to sacrifice the right way. So we've been looking at this verse, it says this, the prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. So my question for you is, what warning signs are you already seeing in anger within yourself, frustration within yourself, disappointment at yourself, disappointment in those around you, frustration? That's a warning sign right now that maybe your priorities are off. Men, are you spending too much time at work and your relationship with your kids, you're already starting to feel the separation going and you're going, you don't know what to do about it, so it's just easier to spend even more time at work because you feel competent there and you don't know how to deal with your 16-year-old daughter's emotions. But maybe you need to sacrifice some of the work hours. Maybe you need to sell off some stuff like that car that's just too expensive so that you can have some, some space that you don't have to be working all the time to pay for that car and instead give your best to your family and the kids. It's not gonna be easy. Sacrifice never is, but trust me on this. I don't believe you can sacrifice truly for God because every time I've ever sacrificed for God, I'm like, this is gonna be so hard and I sacrifice. And then he's like, watch this. He opens the floodgates and just overfloods me with blessings I never could have seen coming. And I thought I was sacrificing. And meanwhile, I'm going, I, couldn't, I can't believe it can be this good. And he's like, yeah, I just needed you to let go of what you were holding on to that was no good for you anyways. Now I can bless you with what you really need. So what do you need to sacrifice this morning? Let me ask you this. Are you making the right sacrifices? And you already know what it is. I believe you know the tension's already been building. That's why you're sleeping on the couch, right? You know the tension's been building. You know what's going on in you and only the Holy Spirit can guide you and speak to you, but he will speak to you. But when he speaks to you, you've got to decide, all right, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to make the right sacrifice in this season so that I can honor what God honors. And when I seek his kingdom first and his righteousness, all that other stuff I'm freaking out about, my security, connection, control, he's gonna take care of as I seek him first. Do you guys receive that? Oh, yeah. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that you sent your only son to pay the price. You valued us so much that you gave your only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So I thank you for that. I pray for those this morning that they know they haven't been making the right sacrifices. They've been feeling the tension building in their marriage in their relationship with their kids and their finances. I pray, Lord, that you would just give them the courage today to lay it down, put it on the altar, sacrifice whatever needs to be sacrificed in this season. And I believe, Lord, that you're gonna bring the dream back to life in a glorious form. I believe also you're gonna provide for us everything we need, security, the connection and control. It's gonna come straight from you. If you're here this morning and you have not given your life to Jesus, I'm gonna say a prayer in a second. If you say this prayer and mean it in your heart, it's not a magic formula or anything, but if you say it and mean it, God is gonna come and forgive you of your sins. He's gonna transfer you from the kingdom of darkness, set you up in an eternal address in the kingdom of light. And it starts by saying this. Let's all say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.